Okay. Steve, yes. would you please open us up in a word of prayer? Or... Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time of gathering. We thank you, Lord, that we do have the right to gather in your church, in your name. Lord, we pray that you will bless this group. Help us in the VBS well coming week, Lord God. Give us strength in all we do. Bless this, bless this little Bible study in your name. Amen. 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 Okay, so online right now we got Joe and we got uh, Gail and we got Linda and Chris. We may be having two others join us online. I'm not sure. I was talking to them earlier. They said they might try to make it, but we'll see. Anyway, in person, we got Joan. We got Anna digging in her purse. We got Pauline. We got Steve. And we got Jan Wentworth. All right. Audrey's on her way. Audrey's just going to be about 10 minutes late. Uh, but she is definitely on her way. And, got, got bit by a bug. And, and you know, Arlene got bit is... By a bug. Got bit. Joe, they're talking about you. <laughs> got bit by He's a on bug. here. Oh. Yeah. yeah. It's definitely shingles, yeah. Okay. It's definitely shingles? It is definitely. I oh. thought you told me it wasn't. Oh, that's shingles. Joe. Ah, oh, dear. Now they're into the test. I saw the eye specialist. He said it's shingles. So now we're back to shingles again. Oh, uh, no, no bug. But it was, you know, the bug bite might have irritated it. Okay. Okay. Okay, so now we're with a bug bite and shingles. I think he needs a new, a new doctor. <laughs> okay, so All right. Chapter 11. Five hours. I took shingles off the prayer list. So I'll put it back on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Very good. All right. Well, anyway, we are on John chapter 11. We're on John chapter 11. And next week, just administratively, next week, we will not be having any Bible study because of Vacation Bible School. And I think pretty much all of us will be so tucked out we wouldn't want to come back anyway at right five o'clock <laughs> for it. So next week, no, no Bible study because of vacation Bible school. So, but we're doing chapter eleven now, and chapter eleven is a real transition chapter. Um, at the end of ten we have the end of Jesus's ministry period. We are now entering into this period that goes between the end of his ministry and the beginning of Passion Week. Now, some include the events in 11 as the end of his ministry period, but it's really kind of a transition thing that Culminates. We've had all these I am statements leading up and these signs, and now this is going to culminate in, in Jesus literally being the life. Because of his raising Lazarus from the dead. And if you notice in John the way it's organized, Jesus' ministry period begins with John the Baptist. And in chapter 10, it, verses 40 through 42, it again talks about John the Baptist. So the Gospel of John, the Apostle John, he, he brackets the ministry with beginning with John and ending with the statement from about John the Baptist. That's just a stylistic thing that he does. Now, this portion that we're about to read in chapter 11, there have been many Bible scholars, different Bible scholars of the time have disputed its authenticity. Uh, it was one of those that was up there in 
in criticism, in, in what they used to call higher criticism. And there was an archaeological discovery way back in 1873, but it didn't really become popularized until about the 1940s, where they found a grave site, a tomb, a family tomb they uncovered, and in there it was actually the inscription of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And so that added validity to this, that here they are, it's near Bethany, and now we got these exact same names from the same dating, from the same time period. So that, that's one of the extra biblical pieces that, that kind of adds validity <coughs> to Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. So let's go ahead and first off, is there any questions from chapter 10 or anything that we've talked about before? Looking online too. Anybody? No? Okay. All right. Well, let's take a look now at chapter 11. Would someone read the first three verses? Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. So notice how this chapter begins very abruptly. If you remember in the preceding chapters, it always had kind of like a transitional phrase that was trying to connect it to the next part, saying then, or as in chapter 10, uh, you know, very truly I tell you, and it kind of continued the conversation. And it always had here, then all of a sudden it just starts off, hey, there was a certain man who was ill. Boom, it's very abrupt. Continue, you know, considering where we just left off. And that's one of the things that stylistically highlights this as a clear division from what was before. We kind of came to an end, remember, Jesus leaving Jerusalem, going over to what's called the Transjordan. He's on the other side of the Jordan River. And we have, you know, the bit about John the Baptist. And then all of a sudden we just pick up, boom, with this guy who's ill. Now, the um, when it, the word used for ill in Greek there is a word that means seriously weakened and feeble. In other words, someone that most likely is going to die. So it's not a, a just a oh the person's sick. This is a very serious sickness, serious illness, and we know that from the Greek word that's used in there. And this idea that Lazarus is in Bethany, and Bethany is located on the east side of the Mount of Olives, and it's about two miles from Jerusalem, and it'll be on the road from Jericho. To Jerusalem. Now, do you remember where Jericho was? Samaria. Hmm? Samaria? No, Jer no, Jericho was on the, along the Jordan River. Oh, yeah. Okay, it was right on. It was right near the river. Remember when Joshua crosses the river and then he goes and he surrounds Jericho, and that's the first city in the Promised Land that they begin to. Uh, take over. Okay. Where did you get the cheese? Cheese? You didn't take the snacks from the no, snack? No, I got you that from, uh, from the Alwana. Okay, good. Alwana. Barbara will get you if you're taking the snacks from the snack. <laughs> no, no, no. 
Oh, nobody wants his No, but if there's some here, I'll go get some. <laughs> so anyway. Hmm. I never realized, Pastor. Yeah. And I've heard that before, but never yeah. the light bulb went on. Um, that that Mary, Lazarus' sister, Martha's sister, was the one who wiped his feet. Correct. I never realized it till now. The light bulb just went on now. Yeah. And yeah, and notice it, it makes that statement yeah. about Mary. And even though that act hasn't happened yet, huh. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. And that act is going to be taking place in the next chapter. Huh. So he's foretelling? Well, what he's doing is, so understand the Gospel of John is explaining kind of in detail and helping people understand who Christ is. And so this leads some scholars, the way John words things sometimes, is it leads some people to think, okay, the people that are the audience for this are familiar enough with what's going on and even though he hasn't mentioned the specific thing yet in the gospel, they would understand, okay, it's this Mary you're talking about. Got it. Yeah, well, this book was written after, after, after. the testimony of Jesus. Well, so all we, of them were written yeah. after yeah. Jesus, right. yeah. So yeah. But, but some of them were written for people that haven't heard right. Right. about Jesus. Where mm -hmm. John, they're thinking, this is a group that actually have already heard and so they're familiar enough, they just kind of need a delineation to understand. Like this headstone has all three names on it. Does that mean none of them got married? Because usually get, mar or get buried with their spouse. Well, they got buried as a family, so maybe none of them ever got married. In church tradition, Lazarus doesn't live too much longer after the resurrection of Christ. In, in church tradition, we don't have anything biblical, but in church tradition, the, the Sanhedrin goes and bumps Lazarus off because they don't want people believing that Christ rose it, resurrected him. Do you think that would be in the Bible? Hmm? That should be in the Bible. Well, their plot to do it is, oh, okay. uh, they say, gee, we need to bump him off. But the actual yeah, thing ain't in there. Yeah? And that's not a part that matters anyway. No, but it's just <laughs> nice to know. <laughs> anyway. Yes. Um, that's what I Anyway. Um, so these sisters, because Lazarus is sick, the sisters send this letter to Jesus, and in there they put the phrase, the one you love is sick. And remember, in, in the Greek, there are multiple words of love in there. And then this one is talking about a deep friendship. It's philo, which is where we get the city of Philadelphia, brotherly love. And so that's what that's the word they're using. So they're saying, hey, there's this deep abiding friendship that Christ has with Lazarus. Okay. So any any questions or thoughts before I go on? This is the same Mary and Martha that were uh was it Mary was sitting at Jesus' feet. Well, Martha was preparing a meal. Yeah. And bustling around. Yeah. And she accused Mary of not helping. Right. That's the same one, right? Yeah. Okay. 
And then Jesus stood with the Brady Bunch, Martha, Martha, Martha. <laughs> Remember that from the Brady Very Bunch? Good. The Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. <laughs> Audrey, Audrey and I used to do that, Steve. Did they? No, Audrey and I used to do that. We would go back to our, our other sister and have a meal and everything. And Ig would be sitting there smoking a cigarette, and Audrey and I would be doing all the work. <laughs> and we'd say, mm. <laughs> Oh. Mm. Oh, okay. for those days. <laughs> mm. So let's go on now, and we'll go now look at uh, would someone please read verses 4 through 16? When he heard this, Jesus said, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Yet when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. Then he said to his disciples, Let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago the Jews tried to stone you, and yet you were going back there? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? A man who walks by day will not stumble, for he sees by this world's light. It is when he walks by night that he stumbles, for he has no light. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Then Thomas, called Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. Hmm. Right. So, in this, for thought, it would take about a day for the letter to get to where Jesus is, from Bethany to just on the other side of the Jordan River, the Trans Jordan River. It would take about a day for the letter to get there. So, by if you look at the timing of this paragraph, by the time the letter got there, Lazarus was dead. Because when Jesus finally does get there, they say he's been dead for four days. So isn't that kind of an interesting piece there? Now, Jesus, and then that leads people to say, Jesus says, you know, to the disciples that, hey, you know, he that this isn't a thing that leads to death, that this is gonna be for God's glory. This illness does not lead to death, rather it is for God's glory so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. What do you think Jesus meant by that? I mean, it sounds like a contradiction, doesn't it? Doesn't lead to death. Well, he already knew he was gonna raise him from the dead. So that's why he says it's not going to end in death because he's going to raise him from death. That makes sense. Okay, but he's already dead. He's already dead. Yeah, well, by the time the letter gets there. Yeah. So he's going to show God's glory by raising him from death. Right. But why would he say this, this illness does not lead to death? Because he's not going to say that. No. But later he, he goes on and says, hey, he's dead. <laughs> well, maybe because he's meaning we all get resurrected. So even though there's physical death, there's not spiritual death. Right. And it's the, word, it's the Greek it's word that is used there is that this illness does not lead to, and the death, the word, the Greek word that's used for death there is the absence of spiritual life. And, and part of it is a thing of understanding uh, some of Jewish theology at the time that your death, they, 
Judaism didn't have really a concept of hell like Christianity does. So they had the resurrection and then they had Sheol, the place of the dead. And that place of the dead was the absence of spiritual life. But then remember, there's this whole other part in Judaism. Someone was just trying to come on. Hmm. I lost the connection. I'm coming back. Oh, that was you, Joe? Yeah, I lost the connection. Oh, okay. Um, there's this whole other part in Judaism that didn't believe in any kind of resurrection at all. That when you died, you died, and that was it. From the dust you came to the dust you returned, boom, period. So anyway, when Jesus is using this Greek phrase uh, about the absence of spiritual life, he's more likely talking about the Judaism where the idea that when you die and you're no good, you would end up going into the Sheol in the absence of spiritual life. So he's not really saying he's not dying because the guy's already dead. But notice that Jesus is purposely only giving them a little bit of information at the time. Now, why do you think the disciples are okay with not, with Jesus not saying, oh, he, he's ill, I gotta go to him right away to heal him? Because he had something else in mind. <laughs> yeah, but why do you think the disciples Didn't. don't expect Jesus to want to go and try to heal him right away? They don't think he's that sick. Well, that and also remember why the disciples are there in Transjordan? Remember what happened at the end of chapter 10? They were going to stone him. Yeah, they were going to stone him. They were trying to kill him. And that's why they flee. They left. So the disciples are saying, well, why go, you know, they're thinking, why go back there when you're going to try to kill us? Okay, he's sick. Got it. And that's why later then they argue with Jesus. When Jesus says, I'm going to go back. And they argue with him about it because they're worried about that. Now, because then. Yeah, they arguing with Jesus. I'm sorry, who just stopped? Joe? Joe. I think, yeah, can you just imagine having a goal to argue with Jesus? <laughs> well. <laughs> course. <laughs> I mean, they're so disciples. That's why and they're, they think they're trying to protect them. Turn your mic off. You know? Well, <laughs> it's one of the thing. it's one of the things that helps us to understand that they don't fully understand. And yet, I always got to remember when we're reading this, we got the 2020. We've seen the whole picture. We got it. They hadn't at the time. And so even though they're calling him the Christ and the Messiah, they're not fully comprehending what that means. And we're going to see Jesus even saying that later here in this chapter. I'm just asking a logical question. To me, I and mean, it seems like to me they're only asking what's a normal question to ask. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Basically. Yeah. Yeah. Why would you? I mean, that would be the first thing in on my mind. Why would you want to go back there? Yeah. And so two days go by. Right. Two days go by. We see, and they say then after. This, he said to the disciple, let's go to Judea now. After two days have passed. And that's when the disciples say, hey, Rabbi, the Jews are trying to kill you. What, what are we doing this for? Right. And, and now Jesus has this whole statement 
about 12 hours of daylight. Those walking during the day do not stumble because they see the light of the world, but those who walk at night stumble because the light is not in them. So what's that all about? He's talking more symbolically or spiritual rather than physical. Okay, and what's he saying? He's basically saying, yeah. if you know me <laughs> and have me, um, and you're walking in the light, as he is in the light, <laughs> then we have nothing to worry about. Right. They're worried that people are going to try to kill him. But, hey, yes. we're in the light. Right. Remember, I'm the light in the world. He's already said that. <laughs> so here, and remember in Judaism, the world equals what? The world is the sinful part. We're on a sinful part. Earth is good. It's the creation of God. When, so whenever you see the word world use, they're talking about sin. Bad. Not good. <laughs> and that's why Jesus is the light into this very dark, sinful place. Whenever they use the word earth, they're referring to something that's good. It's the creation of God. And so that's why he says, I am the light of the world. And now this whole 12 hours, 12 hours of day, 12 hours of night, this was the simple kind of ancient world division of the way they did things, okay? And even though it was kind of like, well, basically, you woke up when the sun got up and you went you stopped when the sun went down. And they basically saw that as a 12-hour component. They didn't have daylight savings time. We know today that, oh, shorter amount of daylight, longer amount of daylight. They didn't really, so they would divide it in watches based on where the sun's height was. Well, the sun's at this location now, or the sun's at that location now. So that would determine them what part of the day shift they were in, the height of the sun, or the height at, in the absence of the sun, that's just the dark thing, and they were based on that shift. So this is the way they kind of did things. Uh, they just saw always a 12 hour period. But the whole point, like you said, Jim, is it's spiritual. They're worried about getting killed. He's saying, hey, you got me. Now, the other way, the other symbolic way this is, and we know what's about to happen, right? Jesus is going to be crucified. He's going to die. The light of the world won't be here anymore. So when he says, you know, they don't stumble because they see, but those who do not who walk at night stumble because the light is not on them. And so some see even a broader symbolism to his death on the cross. And remember what happens to the disciples? They all go stumbling. <laughs> in, a, in a way, that's kind of a stretch because it doesn't relate to the, it doesn't fit the total context of where it's at but it, it is something that can be seen. Yeah. Anyway, and then after saying this, he, he says, hey, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm gonna go wake him. And notice the disciples' reaction to that. Yeah, it's a good thing, right? It's a good thing to be asleep. You'll heal up. Joe, it's good for you to sleep. You'll heal up. <laughs> yeah. Get all better. Yeah. Is he snoring already? <laughs> Same thing with you, Chris. Just sleep more. You'll get better. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I sleep more. <laughs> sleep at night. I sleep during the day. It's all good. 
There you go. <laughs> but Jesus finally had, you know, the disciples still are clueless about what he's saying. And Jesus says clearly then, hey, he's dead. We're going to go. And then notice you have Thomas' statement about let's go and die with him. What do you make of that? Well, he didn't have to name Doubting Thomas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's another. He thinks Jesus is just going to be stoned, or was he being sarcastic? No, I think he thought it was that desperate of a situation. No, I'm talking about Thomas being sarcastic. Yeah, he's not. Thomas isn't being sarcastic. No. No, no there's nothing in it that's being sarcastic. Thomas is. One, conveying a very normal um, response. response, Jewish response, mm -hmm. to, to funerals, to basically, you, you go to mourn someone, you're dying with them, the grief is so extreme. We don't really... Um, Middle Eastern custom to this day, funerals are very, very, very emotional. There is there is much wailing and weeping and just sometimes what we would call screaming mm -hmm. as they they mourn the loss. And it goes on for days. It's not just, oh, we're gonna have a funeral here and have, have a little social time afterwards. Okay, that's over. Moving on. <laughs> that's how it is in America. Yeah, for them, it literally goes on for days. The mourning period goes on for days and it's extremely emotional. And so what Thomas is saying is really very standard kind of Jewish response. It, it's showing a connection. You're close enough to Jesus. Obviously, okay, Lazarus and Jesus are close. They're friends. We're close to Jesus. Therefore, our friend Jesus is mourning. We're going to be in mourning. We're going to go and die with him. But notice Thomas totally misses the point of what Jesus said. I am going to wake him. That point is totally missed. Christ has told them, hey, he's this way for the glory of God. That means something's going to happen. And then Jesus has already said, even though he said he's dead, Jesus has said, I am going to wake him. And notice how no one catches that. Did someone have something online there to say? Yeah, verse 11. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I gather that I may awake him out of sleep. Yes. And everyone misses that. But isn't the word rest wasn't it a form of saying that a person could be dead to the Jewish people? When you, when that they are asleep. That's it's asleep. used a couple it's used a couple times. Yeah. It is used a couple times. In, in scripture in the Old Testament to refer to a person being dead, dead. Yeah. that they are asleep, they're rest, they're asleep. Right. but not as as frequently as we use it Think. yeah not as frequently as we even use it today we use we use that phrase more often do we well, when you if you have an animal, you're gonna put the animal down. You're, some people say, "Oh, I'm putting them to sleep," wow. and and we kind of have that connection to death that way. It's like <clears throat> euthanasia. Yeah. yeah. But so here we go. So now what they're gonna do is remember it's gonna take them a day. It takes them a day to get there. So we have a day to get the letter. Two days stay in. He then says he's going to leave, and now they're going to make the trip. That's another day. There's your four days. Okay? So now, if someone would read verses 
um, 17 or 18, I'm sorry, 18 through uh, 44. Or you could do 18 through 35 first. We'll just cover Mary and Martha's response. Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. <clears throat> Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who was to come into the world. And after she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her. Notice how quickly she got up and went out. They followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord. They replied, Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind, blind man have kept this man from dying? Okay, let's just end right there. Yeah, and we'll just cover that part first. So, Martha, calm, cool, collected one. She hears Jesus is coming to her. He, she goes out to meet him. He's not in Bethany, not yet. He's not at the house. She's going out to meet him because she hears he's on his way. Mary, she's staying at the house. And notice Martha, right off the bat, says, hey, if you had gotten here, you could have healed him. And notice Jesus is the others follow on to that, which Mary doesn't do, but I know, I know you can do whatever you need to do, whatever God allows you to. If you had been here, you could have healed them, but I know even now you can do anything. So what a statement of faith this is made by Martha. People who slam Martha because she was the one working in the kitchen while Mary was at Jesus' feet. <laughs> Gotta remember, Martha's the one that's calm, cool, and collected and also has the faith and recognizes really who Jesus is and says that, hey, even now, you could still do it. I recognize that. Because you, you, whatever God wants you to do, you can do it. And Jesus tells her that her brother's going to rise again. And Mary says, yeah, I know. And at the end, there'll be a resurrection. She gets that. So she, she recognizes that Christ can do anything, but she's not explicitly asking him to do it. And she's kind of not assuming anything. And Jesus then makes that famous I am statement. I am, again, at, in the sense, in the language of I am that's used in Exodus, 
I am the resurrection and life. And anyone that believes in me, they'll never die. And that's, a, that's a, an interesting, we'll never die. <coughs> Spiritually. Yeah, well, this is actually a, a, an actual death death, the word that's used there. Oh, really? Yeah, and you see, so that's an interesting thing. And that's why, that's why theologically, some say that when you die in Christ, when you pass in Christ, you are but asleep. And the resurrection will come and all will be awakened. Isn't that an interesting thought, huh? <laughs> yes. Yeah. But not a lot of sleep. Just I have time to pass. Not a lot of sleep. Yeah, but that, yeah, so they say, well, Christ says you'll never die. And it's literal death, physical and spiritual, the whole nine yards. And in, in that, we, he's talking about also the resurrection to life. And because we're resurrected, we're never really dead. Because we're resurrected, we're never really dead. Yeah. Well, then we can't be resurrected because you only get no, resurrected you're, if you're, you're dead. Yeah, you're resurrected. But the thing is, is that it's not the it's not a death. A, death is a finality. In there, you are not dead. You are resurrected, and, and you see that's just it's kind of a, a play on when you think theologically of a death, it is a final, and that's it. There's nothing, and that's why it says those who believe will never die. But those who don't believe, they're going to die. They will be no more. It's an inter It's kind of an interesting way to that to think about that statement of Christ and all that it means. So and that, but, I'm, but I'm just letting you know that's why some would say. And in some denominations, it's a real big part, it's a real big theological statement within the denomination that you are not dead, you are but asleep. And, and you'll be awakened. Christ will come again and awaken all who have died in him. The Seventh day Adventist uh, think that way. Because right. um, I got that with uh, Rose, and, Rose and Judy, because they were out of the Seventh day Adventist. Right. So what I told him, I said, uh, well, if you look at the rich man and Lazarus, where did their spirit go? One was in hell, one was in one was in heaven, or Abraham's bosom. Well, and the thief on the cross. Yeah, and the thief on the cross, thief Jesus the cross. saying, Today you'll be with me in paradise. That's exactly what I told him. I said. And even Stephen, when he was being stoned, he looked up at the Father and he saw Jesus on the right hand of the Father. Yeah. But you see, it, it goes it, even in the idea about the spirit mm -hmm. being in paradise, mm -hmm. that just reaffirms the notion you're not dead. Yeah, and what I told them was, I said it's a resurrection of the right. body, right. not just it's just the total resurrection of the body and the transformation of the body, going back to going back to what God intended as far as our body was concerned. Mm -hmm. So that's that's how I got around that one, that argument. I'm feeling very funny. <laughs> <laughs> but in, fun in funerals, in, in, when someone does pass, die, whatever, they, we mourn our separation from them, really. That's what we're mourning. That's what we're grieving, that we're not interacting with them like we used to. But in, in Christ, we know that that's not it.
And this, this thought, this idea, this understanding of the resurrection and life, and Christ being the resurrection and life, this is one of those things that made it possible for Christians to almost joyfully allow themselves to be martyred. And not put up a fight. Not, okay. It's an honor to suffer. That Christ considers me worthy enough to suffer for him. That's great. It's the pain going through it, though. <laughs> it's the pain. That's true. There's, yeah, definitely pain. But it's just, and, and it's one of those things that really, it's kind of a, it really is a faith moment. Do you got enough faith to actually believe that? Or do you see death as being something final? That be it. And and this it, it becomes an eternal play. It's part of our own growing in Christ. And where do you see that? The disciples at this point, they see it as very, very final. Kind of like I think probably most of us would too that this whole resurrection thing eh, we, we haven't physically seen it so it's kind of this nebulous thing out there <laughs> okay so that's with Martha then Martha goes so Martha goes back and gets Mary so you know comes out to meet Jesus then she goes back. Jesus keeps on trumping along, but Martha, I guess, went quicker. Gets Mary, tells Mary about him, and then Mary comes out to see Jesus. Now, this by this time, he's closer to he's closer to the house, closer to the area, and Mary does the same thing a little bit that Martha does, but she doesn't add the little pieces that Martha does. She just says, hey, if you had been here, you could have raised her. And with her, there's a bunch of the Jews that were mourning with them that came with her. And she's very emotional. She's weeping. She's passionate about it. And even says she kneels at his feet. If you had been here, he would not have died. She's that overcome with emotion. And she doesn't add the thing like Martha, I know you could raise him. And notice Jesus, it says, he's so moved by her weeping and seeing the people weeping. So this is Jesus' humanity. Christ knows what he is about to do, right? Why do you think he was weeping? Because there's still suffering there because you, when someone you love suffers, you suffer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he's human. Even though you know it's going to be okay, and that there's a happy ending of the story <laughs> coming, yeah, when someone else is grieving, yeah, it, it, it can move you to tears. Very easily, it can move you to tears. I got to admit, as a professor, I was always a sucker for a student that started breaking down crying or something. If something didn't go well in you know, the course for them, <laughs> they weren't doing well. If that student started really crying and getting upset, and I mean, I could tell it was genuine, they weren't just acting. Yeah, I, I was pretty much a sucker for that. That's a man thing. I don't think women get, get into tears like that. 
cousin or anything. I'm sorry. Okay. I've seen it done to our trustees. Somebody come and ask for something and start yeah. crying, and then trustees will give them anything they asked for. So, really? Yeah. 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 Well, what do did you say? Well, I'm not just talking. I'm not just talking about women crying. She said no. it's a man thing. It's a man crying. Thing. crying. No, that when somebody starts crying. Oh, What'd you say, Joe? Um, when he was a professor. Called me a sucker. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. that's basically what she's doing. Yeah, that's right. He's got a soft spot right. for a crier who didn't do yeah, the work. Yeah, yeah. I say women don't have a soft spot yeah, for yeah. a sucker. Yeah, yeah. She just, yeah, yes, yeah. Yes, I do. Oh. Hey, there you are, Joe. There you are, Joe. Yeah. When you saw Not Jesus, when no. it, hey, Joe, when it said Jesus wept, you just say, sucker. <laughs> That's something different. That's somebody dying, not getting a bad mark. Getting a bad mark is different. I think it affects women just as much as men. A I death, think it's the nature of the person. A death, but not a bad mark. Right. Not a bad mark. Yeah. Well, no, maybe because, because I've gone through this. Might make a difference on my feelings. He's getting yes. a bad break. Again. Okay, okay. we're yeah. moving off of this. <laughs> <laughs> I got a big idea. <laughs> I'm sorry, Joe. What'd you say? Yeah, we sure did. Yeah, there. I, I, yeah, I know. Now you understand what it's like online for the poor people because oh, you're all right. this arguing going on. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 Okay, yeah. moving yeah. along. <laughs> Moving along. <laughs> yeah, you better. <laughs> Moving along. So then we got Jesus wept, but he then notice he doesn't say anything else to Mary. He just asks, where have you laid him? And then they take him to them. Now, once they get to the tomb, you know, it's the old come and see. Jesus wept. Get to the tomb, and we have then this this set right here, um, and we got a little insert there. What the crowd saying? Wow, this person who hand, healed the blind man. Notice everyone is still focused on the blind man who was born blind healed. That's that's the sign that they're focused on. Jesus, you know, comes to the tomb, and the tomb's this cave, and there's a stone lying in front of it. Jewish burial was typically, they'd have a cave, and often it was a, a man-made cave, something carved right into the side of a stone. And what they would do is typically wrap the body they didn't do embalming like we do embalming what they would do is they would pour perfume over the person they wrap up the body and they stick it on a slab in this cave and it would decompose and after a year of the body decomposing then literally they'd have people whose profession it was, kind of like an undertaker, but they'd come in and they'd break the body apart into bones. And they had a little box and they call it a bone box and they'd stick all the bones in the bone box and then put it on a shelf. And now, and, and so in this one cave could be the burial spot for generations of a family. So when they found Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, it was the bone boxes they found? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. When Joseph says, can we, yeah, when, when Joseph's father in Genesis says, carry my bones back up, he's literally talking about just carrying his bones, the bone box. I always imagine family yeah. and Dick and her mom and Karen. And, and the interesting thing is when they did find, uh, they did find a mummified person, a person who had been involved that with the name of Joseph, the same name that Joseph had for Egypt. Mm -hmm. And that kind of confirms because Joseph being Egyptian, second head Egypt, he would have been involved mm -hmm. in everything. Mm -hmm. 
But yeah, Jews didn't embalm. So, so this whole cave could cover the family for generations and generations and generations. Yeah. Did they have embalming then? In Egypt, they did. Did they? Yep, and in Persia, they did. But they did not, Israel didn't believe in embalming. They just believed. I just thought it was early that they might have not known. Yeah, well, you see, on both theologically, on both sides, the reason they didn't believe in embalming, I mean, they had techniques for doing it, but they didn't believe in doing it because the ones who believed in a resurrection didn't see it as a bodily resurrection. They saw it as a spiritual resurrection. Okay. And so the body would have got to just returned to the dust anyway. And those who didn't believe in the resurrection, they just saw the body returning to dust anyway. So we shouldn't be organ donors. Really? <laughs> 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 Well, in Christianity, so in Christianity, because of the bodily resurrection, there was all, historically all this concern about the body, and and that's why if you if if you def, defaced the body in some way, shape, or form, they felt, oh, that would really do you in, or in why they burned witches the whole thing of burning someone or someone who committed blasphemy or heresy was the idea you can't have a bodily resurrection now there was no cremation well for the longest time there was the idea that it was that christian would never get cremated no but then you know someone woke up and realized Gee golly whiz, since God could assemble the dry bones in the mm, desert that's true. That's true. <laughs> and bring it all together, oh, look, here's all of it, finally. <laughs> at, right at 6 o'clock. I know. <laughs> that's that's the she knows she to <laughs> Why bother, dear? <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway. Holy so, so much for the people. He then the says, like a fish food. let's go ahead and get through this here since we're almost at six o'clock. He then, you know, Jesus then says, roll away the stone. And Martha is the one who speaks. So Martha is basically the one in charge for the family on this. You know, and she says, hey, Lord, it's been four days. He stinks. He's oh, <laughs> And Jesus says, do it anyway. And Martha had to have agreed to do it. Because they go ahead and they roll the stone away. And when they roll the stone away, he has that prayer to God. Right there, uh, beginning in 41. Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me. I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe you sent me. And he gives the whole purpose for what he's about to do. And when he says this, he cries out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. And Jesus said, unbind him and let him go. And then notice what it says. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. So you've got a group that believes in him, believes in Christ because of it. And remember, one of the themes in the Gospel of John throughout is see and believe. See and believe. So they saw and they believed. But notice some of the other ones go running off to the Pharisees. When they go running off to the Pharisees, the Pharisees end up calling the council, meeting of the council. The council is the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was 70 ruling Jew Jewish rulers, ruling people, 
leaders and that group of 70 was called the Sanhedrin. They made all law for all those in Israel. Of course, it didn't trump Roman law, but it was Jewish law that had to be followed and they made decisions for it. They would also act as a court for trials. And they meet about this and here you get the high priest Caiaphas saying, you know, you know, it's better for one person to die than for the whole nation to be destroyed. Because what they're worried about is if Jesus is a person that's going to rally all the Jews around him, what will be Rome's reaction? Put down a rebellion. Well, they're, that's what they're afraid of. Mm -hmm. And they've already suffered historically here before Christ. They already have suffered through Jesus never multiple. Said to lift a hand against the I'm sorry, Joe. Say it again. I said, but Jesus never told them to lift a hand against the knife. I said, but Jesus never told them to lift a hand against the knife. Right, he didn't. Why are so worried about it? Right, but the Sanhedrin are, if you, if you give them the benefit of the doubt, let's just say, we know they're not good religiously, but if you give them almost the benefit of the doubt, historically they've gone through a few others just recently claiming people claiming to be the Messiah have gathered together armies and have tried to you know throw off the Roman government be like Judas Maccabee reestablish Israel as a kingdom and each successive time, the Romans have gotten more and more severe with them. And so, on one hand, you could say, okay, the Sanhedrin's looking at this and saying, well, if we, if we go through this yet again, we're going to be in trouble. Now, they're not thinking about God here. And they're not even, notice these religious leaders, high priests, everything. They're not asking, what would God have us do? They're worried in a purely secular kind of way. And they're thinking politically. And they don't seem at all impressed by miracles. <laughs> you well, know, what are you thinking? How? <laughs> and they don't seem, you know, this man's performing miracles. People can't perform miracles, so they didn't even want to explore that aspect right. of Jesus. All they see, though, is that, boy, this is really getting him a follower and making him popular. And gee golly whiz, here we are, the Passover's coming up. There's going to be all these people coming into Jerusalem, literally, you know, hundreds of thousands. Oh, my goodness, you're going to hear about him raising someone from the dead? What a following he's going to have. But this was also a time when Pilate, as governor, would be bringing in two legions of Roman soldiers. It's a power keg. It's going to blow up. And so Caiaphas makes this statement that it's better for one person to die than a whole nation to be destroyed. And they set in motion this idea that Jesus has to die. And we end then with this part in 11 where they say, now the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that anyone who knew where Jesus was should let them know so that they might arrest him. And it's kind of an interesting thing. They know where Jesus is. He's in Bethany. <laughs> mm -hmm. But 
they want more information. They're trying to find a play, and they're going to find see Jesus in person pretty soon here. But they want to find a location where he That's wants to be with the crowds. I'm sorry, Joe. Say again. I said I think it's pretty, it's pretty symbolic when he called Lazarus out about going through the darkness into the true light. Jesus being the light of the world. Right. He's not in a dark, empty tomb wrapped up in his presence. Yes, some do see that symbolism of the tomb, the darkness of the tomb, and coming out. Yeah. Okay. So there you go. We're done. No Bible study next week. Okay, because of vacation Bible school. And then we'll see you the week after that, and we'll be on then to chapter 12 and getting into the whole passion week here. Okay. Very good. See ya. I'm not sure what happened to Gail when she popped off. But... See ya. Bye. She was there. She was, but she ended up popping off. Oh, that's the whole chair. I like that chair. See ya, Joe. Hope you get better. That's a whole chair.